Welcome to Understanding Islam. This week we're going to look at modesty, a special characteristic of a Muslim. Can I remind you that if you've missed any of these episodes of Understanding Islam, either in series one or in the present series, you can find them on the Ahlalbayt TV website on the On Demand section. And in this week's talk, there are quite a lot of Quran references. And if you want to find those, then you need to go and download the article that goes with this talk from my own website. So there was an occasion in which Prophet Muhammad was asked about different religious communities. And he said that different religious communities had different characteristics. So the followers of Jesus, for example, are supposed to be characterized by being tender-hearted because Jesus is the prophet of a compassionate heart. And then he went on to say, and my community will be characterized by modesty. So modesty, therefore, the special characteristic of a Muslim. One of the very few Arabic words that has entered into people's consciousness when they think about Islam is the word hijab. Quite often the word hijab is given all sorts of wrong meanings. People think hijab means this long enveloping cloak that's often black or the chador. Sometimes people think that it's a, a, a sheet which covers you from the top of your head right down to your ankles. That comes from the Afghan region and is called a burqa. Sometimes Muslims will say the word hijab as though it meant a headscarf. And sometimes hijab is spoken of as though wearing a piece of cloth on your head was the most important thing about being a Muslim. So let's explore this concept of modesty. And let's begin by looking at the way that the word hijab is used in the Quran. We're told, for example, that there is a hijab between heaven and hell which can never be crossed. There is a hijab between belief and unbelief. There is a hijab between the believer and God, which is lifted in paradise. There is a hijab which screens Moses, so that God speaks to Moses from behind a hijab. We're told as well that Mary, when she is pregnant, takes herself off into seclusion behind a hijab. There is a hijab between belief and unbelief. So we get the idea of a hijab being a barrier, a partition, a division. This is the way that it's normally used in the Quran. When we think of hijab as petition or curtain or barrier, then we can see our own examples that a hijab would be the curtain that we draw across the cubicle for changing in a, a clothes shop. Or a hijab would be the door of the toilet cubicle or the shower cubicle. Or a hijab might be the curtains that we draw in the bedroom when we're going to change our clothes during the day. So a hijab then is something that preserves human modesty. And in Islamic understanding, modesty is something that ennobles the human character. So it's not just something for Muslims, but it is an essential quality of being human, that it 
ennobles and dignifies the human character. We meet the term hijab, meaning curtain, in the Quran in a particular instance when Prophet Muhammad on his wedding night with Zainab had invited people to come back and eat together after the marriage. And they overstayed their welcome. And so we're told that he went off for a walk, hoping that they would take the message. And he came back and they still hadn't gone. And then he went off again and came back. And eventually they got the message. And he drew a hijab across the room to divide it between the intimate sphere, where he was going to be with his wife, and the public sphere, where he other people could come, where he could be consulted by people. So that we get the idea of a hijab or curtain dividing off different spheres of human activity. Now we can actually think of three spheres in this sense. There's the intimate sphere, which is the marital bedroom. There is the family sphere, we're all family together. And then there's the public sphere, that is, when anybody is welcome to be present. Now, if you think about it, different sorts of behavior, of speech, and of dress are appropriate in these three different spheres. So we can think of the kind of conversation that one may have in the intimate sphere, one wouldn't have in the public or in the family sphere. The way that one dresses in the family sphere may not be the same as the way that one dresses in public when other people are present. So we can think of being divided then into three spheres in which there's a different code of conduct for each. A code of speech, of actions and of dress. Each of these being divided by a hijab. So in Muslim understanding, modesty is a human characteristic that ennobles the human being. But Muslims are particularly called to show an exemplary form of modesty in their speech, in their actions and in their dress, as though they are pointing to this human quality by the way that they conduct themselves. So. Muslims are opposed to public nudity, for example. So changing rooms should have private cubicles, not communal changing rooms for everyone, even in the way that dead bodies are prepared for burial. So that a dead body is to be washed by people from the same sex, and indeed the body is to be washed underneath the covering of a sheet, so that you do not gaze in death upon that which you shouldn't gaze on in life. So a very real sense of modesty ennobling human condition. When the Quran comes to speak about this concept, the first verse is addressed to men, and it says, you are to lower your gaze, to guard your modesty, and God knows best what you do. And then the same verse is repeated again to women. So modesty is something for the human being, it's not a concern for women. The Quran begins by saying you are to lower your gaze so that we can see the eyes are the way in which external images enter into our hearts, enter into our human condition. If you look at things that are going to provoke all sorts of thoughts which are immodest, then you're going to be feeding these lower desires within oneself. 
To be sexually attracted to someone is a natural part of being human. But the Muslim tradition is saying we must discipline that. We must rise above just giving in to our natural attractions. Now unfortunately advertisers also know about this. And the way that they provoke us and make us want to buy their goods is by showing us images. The images can be shocking, they can contain nudity, they can be provocative, they grab our attention so that we want to buy their things. This sort of visual temptation then leads to desire and the desire leads to action. So this we can call then hijab of the heart. The way that our heart expresses its deeper emotions is with our tongue. This is the way that we speak, not just the content of our speech, but also the manner of our speech. We can say things in a way that is flirtatious, that elicits a sexual response from somebody else. So both content and manner of speech must be brought under control and discipline in this way. But not just speech, but the way that we walk, the way that we stand, can provoke immodest thoughts in other people. They're a way of showing the intention of our hearts. So this stage we can call the hijab of the tongue and the hijab of the body. If we turn now to thinking about dress, I dress in a certain way, first of all to preserve my own modesty, but secondly to help other people preserve their modesty as well. So it's a two-way process. There is no such thing as Islamic dress. The way that a Muslim would dress in uh, Iceland or in sub-Saharan Africa or in Europe or in China would be very different, different by culture, different by temperature and climate. What there is, however, are Muslim principles for dress. And these principles are then put into practice in different cultures, in different climates around the world. And these principles are essentially twofold. First of all, that the material from which our clothes are made should not be see-through. And secondly, that they should be loose-fitting. They do not reveal the contours of the body. This is why you will often find Muslim men and women wearing garments that hang from the shoulder like the Arab abaya, for example, or from the Indian subcontinent, the shalwa kameez, because they cover up the whole of the body and they do not reveal the contours, whether one's moving or sitting or going about one's normal practice. It is perfectly possible to cut, for example, a Western business suit in a way which conforms with Islamic principles. One cuts the trousers on a fuller style so that they don't reveal the contours of the legs and one cuts the, the top, the tunic or the jacket, perhaps to mid-thigh level and let it hang from the shoulder so that one is again preserving the, the modesty of the figure, whether it be for a man or for a woman. So the principle then, loose flowing clothes that hang from the shoulders and do not reveal the contours of the body. You see, the Islamic requirement is not that one looks dowdy. Beauty, we're told, God is beautiful and God loves things of beauty. Now, what is beauty and how is it different from attractive? Beauty somehow is a quality of the inner person that shines and radiates from them. Whereas attraction is to draw somebody else's attention 
to some part of our body or to our whole selves. There is a, a saying of Imam Ali here in which he says that the beauty of our inner selves is more beautiful than that of our outer selves. So beauty somehow emanates from the inner self, the heart and spirit of the person. So what we're talking about here is being beautiful without being provocative in the way that one dresses or in the way that one conducts oneself. This idea of being beautiful, we can see this being played out when people go to the mosque. Especially when you go to the mosque and there's a large group of people there and it's going to be a fairly dense gathering, like on a Friday or for a big festival. People are told, first of all, make yourself pleasant to be with. So, people take a shower, people put on clean clothes, they brush their teeth, they don't eat garlic or other things that are going to make their breath smell, so that they will be pleasant to be with. And then, when the men's ranks and the women's ranks have gathered together, it's not unusual that people will apply some perfume. Because you are making yourself beautiful for God, you are making yourself pleasant for other people of the same sex to be near, but you are not being provocative or making yourself alluring to other people of the opposite sex as you go on your journey to the mosque, for example. Now you will notice that up until now, everything that we have been saying applies to both men and women. And again, this principle goes on when we ask, well, what is the principle of how much of the body should be covered? Because the principle is cover up. One should be covered. How much? Except that which naturally appears. So, the head, the face, the hands, the feet, for example. And so, for both men and women, the general principle would be high necklines, long sleeves, long trousers, or long skirts. And yet, Islam is also very sensible and practical. So, for example, men who are working in the field, or who are doing heavy manual labor and are sweating a lot, or who are working in a, a dirty environment, are allowed to remove certain parts of their clothing, to roll their sleeves up, to roll their trouser legs up, even to take their shirt off, provided that they keep covered the private parts. Now, the private parts for a man are from the navel to the knees. And the same principle applies for women too, except that for a woman, the private parts include the top half as well. But obviously a woman who is working away in a washing tub, for example, is going to be rolling up her sleeves when she is engaged in this way. So we see the principle then, covering up except for that which naturally appears, the hands, the feet and the face. There is another verse in the Quran that is speaking to women and it says that they are to not display their aura. Aura is a difficult word to translate. We normally need to call on several English words. Their allurements, their charms, that which attracts and provokes attention. These are aura. Most scholars will agree that aura includes the hair because it's one of the beautiful and attractive parts of being a woman. Therefore, it is reserved for that intimate sphere in which one is with one's partner in the marital bedroom and it can also be shown in the family sphere. 
The family sphere means with those people who are too closely related that they could not be possible marriage partners. So for a woman, for example, she doesn't have to cover her hair in front of her children, in front of her brothers, in front of her father or her husband, but she would, for example, in front of her brother-in-law. So it's that question of how closely related you are, whether it would be possible for you to marry that person. So this is where the idea of wearing a headscarf comes into the equation. Different schools of Islam interpret covering the hair in different ways. Some people wear a turban, some people will wear a cloth which fits just around the hair and the ears. Others will extend that cloth so that it comes around to the chin in this way. Now, it's common in hot, sandy conditions in the desert, for example, that all men and women wear a head cloth because it stops the sand getting into the ears and into the hair and it protects the head and the face from sunburn and from windburn. Quite often then, these head cloths will have a long tail that can be drawn across the mouth and nose when the sand is blowing, when the wind is strong. There are those few Muslim groups who wear a face veil. This is called a niqab. It's worn by a tiny minority of Muslim women in total. Some groups don't wear a niqab at all. You will find some people who say it is not a requirement, but it is an act of additional piety for those women who want to wear it. And it's worth noticing that as Islam spread into different cultures, it met different ways that women would cover themselves. So Persian high-class women, for example, would wear a face veil that just left the eyes revealed. So these are often cultural differences that come in, in different places around the world. Join me next week when we're going to talk about the rituals associated with birth and death in the Islamic tradition.